coffee and climate change. It came onto the agenda probably about uh, a decade ago and was viewed very much as something that was going to happen and it was very much on the margins of people's um, thoughts about sustainability and resilience. And then there was the extended wet period in Central America, followed by drought in Brazil, and that moved climate change, I think, really onto center stage um, in the sustainability uh, agenda. Essentially, there are two questions that we need answers to, and which we don't have yet. The first one is, what's going to happen across, say, this century? And then once we know that, we can answer the second question, is what are we going to do about it? So are we facing a rather grisly Armageddon, or are we looking at something that's perhaps more benign and something that's more manageable than we might expect it to be? So when I stood in front of uh, the audience at the SEAA in Boston in 2012, I talked about some of the work we'd done on climate change for wild Arabica. I won't go into detail, but what I will tell you about is what happened afterwards. And there was quite a bit of media attention, and it was very interesting to hear the, uh, people's questions um, and responses to the work we'd done. One of the things I wasn't expecting was the question of, OK, that's very interesting, blah, 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 but what are you going to do about it? And that really, really threw us. What, what, actually, what would we do about it? We've got an idea of what's going to happen, but what would we do about it? And more specifically, they weren't talking about wild coffee. They were talking about coffee production. So this got us thinking. Um, the team sat down, and we threw some ideas around, and we came up with a, a basic idea of what that might look like. And then in November 2013, we got the opportunity to put some of those ideas to the test. We started a, initially an 18-month project, a very short-term duration project, and there was a big, big agenda. How would we make the coffee economy of Ethiopia climate resilient across this century? Which is quite a big ask. But we set the agenda, so we've got ourselves to blame. Why Ethiopia? I probably don't need to tell uh, you why. It's, it's a major coffee-producing country. It supports the livelihoods of around 12 to 50 million farmers. It provides a huge proportion of the country's export earnings and really drives the economy of this, of this country. We were very fortunate, um, fortunate for us, but not for the hard commodity sector. There was a downturn in mining and we found ourselves with a team of people who, who had good skills to convert to the soft commodity sector. And they brought to the table uh, their ideas and expertise and also uh, some new approaches to, to tackling and looking at this issue, both uh, in the UK but also, of course, in Ethiopia. So we had an, an idea of what we would do, how we would up our game in terms of our approach to our answering the, the two major questions. So there's, there was a the technology side, which I won't go into, and then there was the on-the-ground, field-based side of the study, and that, from the very onset, we considered was a very key element, to make sure that we collected the right data, but also to test all our ideas to see whether they worked. One of the things we didn't intend to do was question farmers, but it's something that became critical to what we were doing. And we also, this isn't our expertise, of course, but we also <laughs> consumed a lot of coffee. We had that roasted by uh, London-based roasted and evaluated to see how that tied in with coffee growing and climate change in Ethiopia. And from November, December onwards, we found ourselves in a deep immersion phase. What do I mean by that? The team was totally dedicated to this project um, in a very intensive way uh, right up until more or less uh, today. So it's been an intensive period, but we've learned a huge amount um, about this issue um, in Ethiopia. So what are the outcomes? 
What's the coffee landscape in Ethiopia going to look like across this century? Now, as a scientist, you question everything. You question what the people do, and you question even what you do yourselves. One of the key issues, I think, and um, baselines, if you like, for this, for this um, project was that Ethiopia has experienced a really drastic change in its climate in the recent past. So when you look at the data from reliable sources, you see an increase per decade of around a third of a degree. And that adds up over several decades to become quite a significant increase in temperature. So what we did is we re-evaluated that. We, we took climate station data from 30 climate stations. We reanalyzed the data, but specifically for coffee grown regions. And what we found was that, that those increases were realistic, were repeatable for several of the major coffee growing regions of Ethiopia. But worse than that, in combination with the increase in temperature, was a decrease in rainfall. So you have this uh, double whammy of um, climate related issues potentially influencing coffee. One of the very interesting aspects, I think, of climate change is that for many crops, there's no data. So one of the early conversations we had is, where are our melting glaciers? Where are our sea level rises? Where's our metrics? Where's our equivalents? And we found that from interviewing farmers. So Ethiopian farmers tend to, uh, their family farms tend to stay in the same places through many, many generations. And what we found, that talking to, to um, the, the father or the mother, and then when they told us about their fathers and their fathers' fathers, they were able to give us an idea of how their farming environment has changed since, say, the 1930s. So in northern Ethiopia, for example, uh, for example we uh, encountered a family whose, uh, whose forefathers had harvest every single year um, then a generation forward, that went down to two years and three years. And in the present day, they have a harvest every five years. So what we were able to deduce from that, and that's already been mentioned this morning, is that climate change happens slowly. Yes, you get tipping points, but it's a slow process. It's been happening for a long time. We also looked at plants. You're independent of farmers or any or humans, just to see what their response was to climate change. And one of the things the modeler said to me was, in the areas that we predict will be influenced by climate change, when you go there, you should start to see that. And that's exactly what we experience. So here we have an example of quite severe climate stress towards the end of the dry season. But in some cases, there was very severe environmental stress, to the point where plantations that have been productive for many, many decades were completely dead. And that's a recent phenomenon. So they have gone over the tipping point. So what does the landscape look like in general? What are the predictions going from the, the recent past in the 1960s, say, to the end of the century? Well, they're quite alarming. And what you see is a drastic change in the coffee landscape of Ethiopia across this century. And you can get some indication of that from the maps behind you. So we see large areas dis completely disappearing. It's not just related to altitude either. Going forward even further, towards the end of the century, even more drastic changes, but you'll notice some new areas emerge. New potential coffee growing areas emerge that weren't there before. Let's go right to the end of the century. You can see even more drastic change but I want you to focus on the dark green, because it's the dark green which identifies those areas which are excellent for coffee growing. And you'll notice that is the, the part of the landscape that's most severely impacted. What does that look like in terms of area? These circles represent the area that is actually suitable for coffee growing across this century. And what you'll see from this is a general, quite alarming decline in the area where it's you know, actually suitable, I should say, for growing coffee. What that detail doesn't show you is the more drastic reduction in the area that's absolutely perfect for coffee growing. 
However, when you look at the potential for coffee production across these time periods, you'll see that compared to, to what we've got and what will happen if we do nothing, if we make the right decisions and the right interventions are made, coffee production in Ethiopia is fully resilient and sustainable if the investment is made in the right places and at the right times. So what am I talking about here? It's a difficult concept to grasp, grasp sometimes, the, the area of suitability. I'm talking about millions of, of dollars per year and millions of kilograms of coffee. So it's far from insignificant. So where is that potential coming from? It's coming from two places. Using highly suitable land more efficiently. So there are plenty of places for growing coffee which don't grow coffee at the present time. And also, there's a huge potential for migration to areas upslope of where they're presently grown. So to areas that are cooler and wetter than th th those areas that will disappear. Now, the burning question that many people come, come to, well, that's fine, but that, that land is being used for other purposes. It may be forested, it may be a nature reserve, somebody may own that land. But what we see in Ethiopia, because of the way we've done the study, is that a lot of that land actually doesn't have a great value and would have more value if it grew coffee. But there's another bonus, because for growing coffee in Ethiopia, you really need forest. So if you're growing forest, you're having an income, you're sinking carbon, you're mitigating, you're improving the environment, you're improving ecosystem services. So it's kind of a no-brainer. So how do we condense all this information down into products that people can actually understand and use uh, for, for, for appropriate decision making? We have two, two main products. One is the strategy document. It's a document uh, designed for major decision makers at the sort of government, NGO level. And that provides very specific details of what's going to happen across the coffee landscape across this century. On one side, there's a bigger scale picture, and on the other side, the 16 coffee areas, what will happen across each time period, what's the confidence in those things happening, and also, what's the model, what does the modeling uh, robustness look like? So here's a more detailed map, and this is now being scaled down to a sort of 200 kilometer hexagon. And this map is basically what it looks like in the present day. And you can see we've designed the study in such a way where we know which areas are most suitable, which areas are least suitable. And we've also mapped on deforestation. Because in some cases, climate change isn't going to be the major impact factor. It will be deforestation. And you can see why that's the case on this slide. You can see areas that will be drastically impacted by climate change. But they're also the areas that are being mostly, most badly impacted by deforestation. So there's a double negative influence. So what we'll see in Ethiopia is a drastic change in the landscape. We'll also see some origins, some terroirs disappear by the end of the century, including but it's highly likely that Harar will not be producing much coffee by the end of the century or even by mid-century. And there will be origins that we uh, as consumers haven't even experienced uh, that will disappear within, potentially disappear within the next 20, 30 years. To make the information more accessible, what we've done is also produced a coffee atlas. This is like a road atlas. It's the 40-page map book of the Ethiopian coffee landscape, and it provides decision makers with much more detail. So to give you an example, here's Geisha. And what you can see is the dark blue area is where there's forest. The light blue is where there's no forest. The green would be where it's a, it's a great place to grow coffee. So if you wanted to have the resources to, to reforest an area, what the atlas does and what the resources do is tells you exactly where to make your investment. Let's just sum up by looking at some of the lessons that we've learned. Or one of the hopes, the aspirations, that we would find that within the landscape something that would provide a quick fix for climate resilience, something, a drought, tolerant Arabica, for example. We have two main genetic groups in Ethiopia. Most of our cultivated Arabica came through Harar, then Yemen, and then out to the world. 
during this uh, movement, if it had the ability to acquire any drought resilience, it would have happened during this migration out of the forests of southeast Ethiopia. So what I'm saying is that we've probably got the best out of Ethiopia in terms of drought resilience. And drought resilience is one of the major issues. And then, when, of course, we've got the so-called wilds, the geishas, the Rume Sudans. So we've got that side of, of the genetic uh, makeup. And I think it's not a huge amount, but as I say, we've probably got the best uh, there, there is from Ethiopia in terms of climate resilience, not in terms of disease or pest tolerance. So one of the things you see when you talk to farmers about resilience specifically, and particularly those farmers that have so-called drought resilient or climate resilient cultivars, is they don't actually give the farmer very much in terms of resilience. Surprisingly, and something that surprised me was that it was the on-farm adaptation which gave the best results for, for farmers. So things like mulching, proper forest management. The farmers were happy with some rather simple cost-effective interventions that made a huge difference uh, to, to, to their livelihoods. Another sort of myth that's already been sort of busted in a way is that um, are actually Arabica is not that um, sensitive. It's quite a robust little plant. Even early planters said they were surprised at the places coffee was able to grow. These are climate these, sorry, these rainfall profiles for Ethiopia, you can see there's a huge variation in the amount of rain that falls in the different coffee growing regions. We also experienced coffee growing in areas with 34 up to 35 degrees centigrade for several hours of the day. And these plants were fine as long as there was enough water in the ground. That said, it's clear, and this was something that was recognized a long time ago, that actually a lot of the world's coffee isn't growing in the most suitable places. And that would include parts of Brazil and Vietnam, for example. And it's those places that are least suitable which will be impacted uh, the, the most uh, and within the most recent time frame by climate change. So they are closest to the tipping point. They are closer to the tipping point than er uh, many areas um, elsewhere in the world. One of the other things we realized that climate change is incredibly complicated. And I think if we need to move forward, we need to make better connections. At the moment, I see there's a big disconnect between what's going on in the research community. People might know something about soils or physiology, but they don't know really anything about coffee or vice versa. So if we need to move forward, we need to make these connections so we, we, can, we can bring all these disciplines together to answer the specific questions. So for Ethiopia, I think we can answer those two questions I posed right at the very beginning. In a global context, if we did the same thing for the major coffee producing countries of the world, and I think we could do that within a decade, we would be in a uh, very advantageous position to understand what the future looks like and exactly what we need to do. In, in summary, I don't think we're, we're facing a grisly Armageddon. We're facing, some, we're facing a challenge. Uh, we're facing a, a, a potentially sustainable future for coffee, but, this is a big but, we have to do the right work now. And once that work's available and we're happy with it, to make the right decisions. Thank you very much.